So my name is Lakshmi and I am speaking to you from the south of India from an intentional community called Oroville uh, in Tamil Nadu today. This is where I live and this is where I have lived for the last um, almost eight years now. I live in a forest that was, re, uh, that was a barren plateau 40 years ago and every tree in this forest was planted by humans. And that inspires me every day. And I think that's a great way to start the day because um, I truly honestly believe that us humans as a species, we have enough love in our hearts to turn this around. All the different crises that we are going through. Uh, and that is what keeps me going despite the breakdowns that I face on a daily basis. Um, climate change as a um, this all encompassing term for me uh, right now, it actually doesn't make any sense to say climate change anymore because uh, for me, it's also about everything that we face in our daily lives, you know, the, the multiple multi-dimensional crisis that we are alive in at this planetary time. Uh, and so um, the, the topic for today is inner and outer transformation. And, and I think both myself and Abhay has gone through our own journeys of inner and outer transformations to, to reach where we have in our journeys, you know? Um, and I will start by sharing a little bit about my own uh, journey where, um, what, you know, how have I come to where I have come and what I do right now. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure that everyone here have your own journeys. Um, that are as uh, poignant and as inspiring as mine. So, which is why I'm still thinking that we would have time to actually connect. It's not a big group. This is my hope for uh, today that um, it remains a small group. So I get to actually meet some of you and get to know you a little bit better. So I um, was born in uh, Kerala uh, and in a very small town. Uh, Kerala is a state in the south of India and uh, very early on um, I was um, I felt very close to nature I love climbing trees um, not going to school uh, you know the general monkey in the backyard um, and as I, I grew into a teenager that um, the feeling of something is happening to this world that I love uh, started creeping in very um, in a very forceful way and of course, teenage time is a time for rebellion. And I rebelled against everything. Um, and that rebellion sort of turned me into a young adult activist, very angry with the world. Um, nothing can go, you know, nothing is right and everything needed change and no one understood. And, um, and being in a small town, it was difficult to find fellow activists or fellow angry people, but I moved. <laughs> into a big city and I found um, other people who were really angry with the world and we were angry with the world together. Um, and I, I think my, uh, my real inner temperament doesn't really suit with the anger that was coming. It was, <laughs> so, so it was more of, I, I think I've been through several breakdowns through, through that period, um, several burnouts. Um, and I was, uh, you know, I, I tried working in wildlife research for a while um, and I didn't find that um, very ethical or, you know, there was always something to rebel against, always something to um, critique against and didn't want to be part of that. And, um, and around the time I was 21 was when I, um, you know, in India by the time, at that time, um, when I was 21, my parents basically told me, okay, you're not making anything out of your life right now. You either get married or find a corporate job because we paid for your education. And uh, that to me was, the, the choices that I were given was not, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't do that. So um, then I got a chance to move to Australia and study. I took it 
Uh, and I had no idea where I was going. I did not know anybody there. All I knew was that I was running away from things that I did not know how to deal with. And I needed time and space um, to be my own person. Um, so I got a scholarship and then I went to do my master's in environment sustainability in Melbourne, in Australia. Um, and that was great for the first time. And I know that fellow Indians or Southeast Asians or people from the third world would um, identify with this. For the first time, I felt like, oh, I can think for myself. Um, you know, and, and I, can, I can talk about the things that I care and there are people who would listen. I can question um, teachers. Um, all of these things were really good. And at that time, I also um, found the teachings of Arne Ness, who is a Norwegian, um, who was a Norwegian professor who coined the term deep ecology. And I really uh, found his uh, teachings, um, I was really drawn to it. It was different from everything that I had read up until then. It was very similar to um, Eastern uh, um, theology or Eastern philosophy that I was used to from India, but it was about the earth. And it really um, drew me, uh, deep ecology, the term. And one way that he describes it is to distinguish that from shallow environmentalism. So, you know, uh, he, he gives the example of, okay, um, when you see a river that is polluted, what do you do? Um, and, and what questions would you ask? Because he came from a school of skepticism that asked questions of everything. So he, uh, what question would you ask? And usually the question we ask is, what can I do? And, and you do what you can do. Uh, and that's the, the general movement towards when you see something that uh, is affecting you. So then uh, Ness, uh, dist uh, Ness called that shallow environmentalism. That's not what I would call it, but that's what he called it. Um, and that was to distinguish that from deep ecology where you would ask the question, why is the river polluted? You know, and then keep asking the why. Okay, why is the river polluted? Because people are throwing things into it. Why are people throwing things into the river? Because uh, they didn't have another place to throw it because they didn't care. Okay, why don't they care? So the more whys you ask, um, the more whys there are to ask. Up until a point for him, it came to a point where after that point, every answer was the same. And that must be an important answer. Uh, and that answer was that um, because we feel separate from the river, because we feel that we are not the river. And that's, a, that's an all-encompassing answer, no? So after that, every why was the same answer, because that's the answer. Um, and so, and it was a, his work is very theoretical. He's written several books. Uh, it's philosophical. It's uh, philosophical engagement with these questions. And I found, you know, I was 23 at that time and I found it um, and I wanted to, I was so excited by it, you know, and I wanted to go to the rooftops and shout it out like, wow, look what I have found. And I, this is important, um, but I didn't know how to talk about it or do anything with it outside of that sphere of philosophical engagement, you know, um, because um, environmentalism is about activism. It's about making change. It's about um, doing the things that need to be done to make the change, you know. Um, and the more you go into these circles and you start asking these questions, people are like, uh, they try to engage with you for a while and then they completely ignore you. So uh, this is at that time. And um, that was when very accidentally, I mean, by coincidence or not, I was invited for a workshop um, run by um, three women who had spent a month a long retreat with Joanna Macy uh, in Southern Australia. And um, yeah, I just ended up, I was asked uh, by a friend, you know, there's a workshop in the bush, do you wanna come? Uh, and I said, okay. It's in the bush and that sounds good. Um, and I go, and I ended up in a facilitator training actually um, of the work that reconnects. And, and to my surprise, um, they talked a lot about Ness's work and how Joanna had worked with Ness and, um, and the, um, you know, a lot of the uh, group work that 
has come out of it also has a foundation in Arnenis's deep ecology. That was a surprise for me. And I really, for the first time, I sat in a circle uh, with 29 other people. We were 30 people and I cried for the earth. I really, really, I spent time crying and being witnessed in my grief and my love for the earth. And I, uh, at that time, I, I had this uh, visceral feeling of how this angst and anger and everything that I felt was really love. You know, um, it was really love that um, did not have a space to, uh, to be expressed and to be witnessed and to be seen. Um, and so, um, for sure, you know, I took to the work, <laughs> I really did. Um, and there were five women who were all in their late 60s and they took me. <laughs> Here I was in a country that I didn't have many people, I didn't have a family. Um, and I had, I found my tribe really. And for the next um, three to four years, while I was, um, while I was um, studying and engaging with environmental work, I also sat with them and learned the work and I was always trying to bridge the gap between the inner work and the outer sort of environmental work that I was doing um, and that was hard because they've they at you know 2007 2005 at that time it was still very apart um, you couldn't you couldn't be seen as a hippie in the very professional environmental world um, I worked in universities mostly uh, managing environmental projects at that time so anyway, um, long story short, um, so I have these two parallels that, that went on for a long time uh, in my life. And a few years, and I came back to India in 2015 and I moved to this um, community where I live now. And yeah, and, and at some point um, I had to say, okay, you know, um, I can't have these two parallel things going on in my life because that was pulling me apart, my insides um, out and I had to bridge it. And that's when the idea for Inner Climate Academy um, uh, came um, a couple of years ago um, where, uh, you know, we provide spaces for um, dialogue and inner inquiry um, um, and reflection and research, inner re what we call inner research, um, for the diverse uh, questions that uh, climate change poses for us as humans. What does it mean to be alive at this planetary time? What does it mean to be human at this planetary time? And uh, what does, uh, you know, uh, what is it asking of us, really? What is climate change really asking of us? Um, there are no answers. <laughs> and I have lots of questions. So I create spaces for these questions and dialogue and see where we can go with it. I will stop there. I've taken longer than I thought I would. Um, bear, bear with me. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I would uh, like to lead you in a, a small meditation, if that's okay. Um, I'm just going to put gallery on just to see everyone. Is everyone okay to go into a, a small meditation, a guided meditation? Just show your fingers if you're uh, okay with it. Um, yeah, great, uh, thanks. So um, it's just um, a very short guided, um, almost a visualization into just where are we at right now with everything that's going on and little bit going a bit deeper into really what's what's going on inside so i welcome you to um, find a spot that's really comfortable you can lie down if that works and you can still hear my voice um, and really uh, if you're sitting uh, imagine that the earth is really holding your weight give her your weight 
So really sink into the chair if you are sitting or if you are lying down. It's okay to put your camera off if that feels right for you. And I invite you to close your eyes and slowly stretch out. Relax into the chair, the floor, wherever you are sitting. Feel your breathing in your lungs. Feel the air, the oxygen move into your body. Feel how it glides in and out. This oxygen gift from the trees. It ignites each cell. It stirs the cell awake as it burns in the metabolism of life. It produces energy inside you. Extend your awareness deep within to feel this energy. It is all around you too, sustaining all the bodies in the room that you are in, weaving us into the web of life. And as you breathe in and out, imagine it as currents of light, threads of light moving into your body and going out, moving into someone else's body and going out. Can you see the interlacing currents of these threads of light? See the, how they connect us and extend beyond the room that you're in, in this moment. And experience the great multiplicity of strands from one tree to one human, to another tree, to another plant, to another human through you into the other, from there into you. Countless relationships woven of the work of others, other beings. And there are other strands too of sources coming into you, food, water, Laughter, tears, they shape what we are, they hold us in place, sense those interwoven threads and rest into them if we can see this web that holds us. See if you can rest into this web. The web that sustains your bones and blood and skin. Concocted so intricately out of food you have eaten. Out of grains and vegetables and fruits and nuts. The soil that yields the grain for your bread. The tree that bears the fruits for you. The hands that plow, sow, reap and gather. They all are of your body now. And back through time, this web extends. Mothers, fathers, great-grandmothers, and great-grandfathers giving you your coloring, your features, your gestures, your tone of voice. The web extends back through countless generations, through numberless ancestors that we share. All the way back to those with gills and wings. For it is of star stuff that we are all made of in the flowing of time. We are each a jewel in this vast net 
that called us into being. Each of us an irreplaceable gem, sparkling with awareness, reflecting the world. The sound of seagulls crying over the sea, sight of mountains rising, colors of sunset and sunrise, sense of pine and loam and incense, the excitement of a new idea, the melody of a half forgotten song. There is pain too, coming in along the strands of light in this web, a friend with cancer, oil spills in the ocean, war, extinction, mass migrations due to climate change, storms, extreme weather, Do not shut them out. They live in this web of this planet time. Open to these sorrows, breathe them in. So the channels may stay open for the flow of energy and life and change. If we block this pain, we block the joy as well. There is power in the flowing of this fluid net love that has enriched us and love that we give. Feel the caring and the love that is flowing through you. Feel the love that this web holds despite everything. To all our brothers and sisters, we open now in this time of great hardship. We go now through a dark place, but we do not go alone. And we do not go without our own timeless knowledge of the dark. We come from it, it is behind our eyes. And we will look into it together until the dark itself is clear. And we come home. There is nowhere you can go where you're not held in that web that sustains us all. Still sensing these connections through space and time, I invite you to slowly start moving your body. Slowly come back into this body. Stretch if you feel right. Move your toes and your fingers and bring your attention back to your breath. And slowly open your eyes and come back. Welcome back, everyone. Okay, before moving on to you, I would just like to see if anyone would like to share very shortly, maybe one word where you're at. Or if you're still in that um, kind of um, relaxed state from the meditation, that's also okay. Um, oh, I can see on the chat, suit, connected. I, I saw your child do that. <laughs> Soft, awake, great, thank you. 
over to you, Abai. Uh, just also to say that I know it's short. I wish we had more time. I always do, but thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lakshmi. I think uh, that was really nourishing for me. And uh, thank you also for, for the introductory comments that in some sense I'm going to uh, draw upon. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Abhay. Abhay Raj Nayak, and I live in Bangalore in the south of India. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. And I think uh, my approach to um, our theme for today, that is uh, uh, climate transformations uh, in and outer dimensions of it, in some sense, uh, is also going to be um, drawing on my own journey and is inspired by a desire to present uh, the multi-dimensionality of, of climate change and climate action. And how I, how I felt it might be useful to, uh, in some sense, uh, uh, create a common vocabulary and, and uh, uh, an atmosphere that allows us to approach this somewhat uh, uh, elusive uh, uh, topic uh, was through uh, three fragments from my journey, right? And, uh, uh, I guess uh, uh, to prevent any surprise, uh, my own approach to the topic is one where I refuse the binary of inner and outer, right? And I'm uh, interested in the inner of the outer and the outer of the inner and the hyphenated inner outer and outer inner and maybe even a, <laughs> a reformulation of the alphabets in inner and outer or, or moving from uh, alphabets to a different uh, dimension of the inner and outer. But that said, that's the end of the story. How did I uh, feel confident enough to say that I, I refuse this binary, right? And, and is it even possible uh, to refuse this binary? Uh, where are the limits of that? I think uh, three uh, stories or fragments from my journey uh, will allow us to, to, to reflect on that. And, and what I have planned at the end of my comments, uh, is a very quick activity. It's not exactly a meditation as much as an invocation uh, to our own uh, uh, lives, our own uh, individual memories, but also our collective memories uh, to see what we can draw from uh, a prior encounter uh, with this uh, uh, elusive topic of the inner and outer dimension of climate transformation. So starting my journey at the end of uh, things really, that is uh, where I am today, um, though I uh, have a full plate of activities, I am a teacher and I offer courses on climate justice. I began my own nonprofit uh, last year and we're really uh, at a very uh, initial and early stage of our activity and it draws a lot of my time. I'll be talking about that in just a moment. Uh, and also uh, running a, a somewhat uh, 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 diverse consulting practice focused on social justice and transformation. Where I find myself today is in some sense uh, embarking on a, a new and uh, definitely unusual project where I'm interested in uh, launching a, a magazine focused on uh, spirituality and ecology, but also very much focused on uh, the Western Ghats in India, uh, the place, uh, the history of uh, uh, climate and nature in this region, right? And I'm also interested in, quite in tune with uh, this entire conference, uh, creating uh, an alternative learning space uh, where um, in, in some sense I can learn with others uh, as to what is transformation that uh, makes sense uh, at, as we approach the end of the world as we know it, right? And, and how I got here was basically uh, uh, the result of uh, a journey to where my uh, people hail from, which is the city of Mangalore uh, on the coast uh, with my mother. Uh, this happened quite recently uh, in uh, late November, early December of last year. And that journey itself, which resulted in about uh, 10 days there of lots of conversation, lots of exploration. I'll try and show you one or two photos of, of that time there as well. That journey was inspired by a recognition that 
Uh, throughout my work as an educator, as an activist, as a community builder, even as a researcher and scholar, uh, I constantly felt uh, uh, my uh, ease or my peace disrupted by uh, this fear that came up from somewhere where I wasn't really uh, comfortable with. I was occasionally uh, uh, taken off track by uh, anger, which uh, I didn't really have uh, control over, right? And uh, much as I like to uh, think of myself as a, a, a liberated being, I, I saw within me constantly uh, signs and strains uh, of a toxic masculine uh, patriarchy, right? And so for me, despite uh, the, let's say, reputational success or the economic value or even the uh, buy-in through friends, family, and society for the work that I was doing, quite similar to what uh, Lakshmi indicated, I reached a moment where it made no sense to do anything until I went back into myself, right? Because, because of these disruptions or these uh, inexplicable fears or, or this recognition that somewhere there was something that uh, I still uh, didn't have the ability to uh, speak with or listen to, right? And, and so this journey back to Mangalore, to my ancestral village in Mangalore was really uh, an effort to find ancestors, right? Uh, it was an effort to reconnect with place. Living in Bangalore, it's, I could be living in Stockholm or I could be living in New York, could be living in Berlin, I could be living in Sao Paulo in any big city in the world. It's, it's placeless in that sense, right? And, and through this journey back and through my time uh, in the same home where my uh, grandparents had lived, uh, where uh, the spirits of our community, right, continue to be honored, uh, an animist tradition continues to flourish, I rediscovered some sources of where this fear was coming from, some sources of, of traumas unprocessed in my family line that continue to assert their influence uh, in, in my effective decision-making, right? I also discovered where my responsibility lay, right? Is it uh, sensible for me to be talking about climate change without talking about climate change and what it's doing uh, to where uh, my people, my community, my family, my kin hail from, right? And uh, if I can uh, share the screen, I just want to very quickly uh, put up a couple of photos uh, and also share a, uh, a poem from uh, this journey with you, right? Uh, I hope the uh, screen is visible to you. And uh, this is the entrance to that uh, home that I returned to. Um, let me just get rid of it. Yeah. And uh, the words that came to me at the end of this journey, finding slowness, rootedness, and renewal in ancestral places. Webs of time that refuse linearity. Spirits that outlast modernity. Smoky stairways and sooty stoves whispering tales of times long past. The land has worlds with decolonial joys, feudal horrors, myth and healing, forgotten except in the year and now, found again to be lost in plain sight. Right, and uh, on that journey, I also discovered uh, great-grandparents uh, and uh, uh, sort of uh, images of them that I'd uh, not come across before. That's Manjaya and Jalajakshi, a tomb of my grandmother. And in some sense, uh, uh, I, I realized that uh, uh, climate action without a rootedness in, in my climate story, right? The, the Western Ghats, this uh, coastal area of India, uh, very, very biodiverse and extremely climate vulnerable, right? And, and so, so the story or the context or the opportunity uh, that I was searching for, right, to use language for my consulting avatar was very much in my uh, ancestral story, right? And, and that's, that's what I'm excited about in the days ahead. And yeah, that's uh, in some sense uh, 
uh, you know, uh, messing up linear time, uh, really drawing out the stories from the earth, from the water, from the green, uh, and for myself, right? And at the end of that journey, uh, though it's of course just the start of, of a journey, I feel I know a little bit more about uh, how to conquer that fear, uh, even conquer is a word I do want to use, how to be face to face with that fear, right? How to uh, understand the source of that anger and how to create a political uh, agenda of healing. So, so that's uh, context one, uh, and that's just a fragment. The very uh, quickly moving on to fragment two, which is something that uh, many of you all might uh, uh, have a resonance with. Recently, my organization uh, was putting together a panel on climate justice uh, and communities, right? And uh, we were interested in focusing on coastal communities in India. And uh, when we uh, reached out to uh, uh, a leader of fishing communities in India, and we said, would you and uh, some members of your community be willing to participate in this panel? This is part of a conference on radical climate justice. Some of the organizers are very much in this conference as well. Uh, the response we got uh, from this person who we were inviting was, uh, what are the questions you want to ask my people and me? Right? Uh, and she was open to the idea of, of turning up. And we came up with these questions, right? Uh, what are the impacts of climate change? What for you is climate justice? How do you see climate action? What is the role of community in formulating climate policy in India? Very well thought out questions we thought based on lots of research and based on what we knew was hot in the world of policy and scholarly writing. And her response to that was, sorry, uh, we, we don't understand these questions, please excuse us, right? And that's not the story. The story is, I reacted to her reaction with anger, right? What came up for me was, ah, how dare she say no after asking me to give her all those details, right? Uh, and no explanation, no, I'm sorry, just we don't understand those questions. They're not understandable for us. Sorry, please excuse us, right? And that led me to the insight that quite often climate is a unrelatable story uh, for people. Right? It's in some sense uh, uh, not connected with livelihood, it's not connected with survival, it's not connected with forest, right? So depending on who you speak to, climate can be alienating. Right? And for me, the insight was even as I continue to th think of this as the work that is there for me to do, right? Climate action and transformative change in response to the climate crisis, how do I develop the sensibility, the capacity, right? Uh, the overall uh, set of tools and techniques to be okay with losing climate for my script, right? What do I stand to gain when I let go of climate and make it something about livelihood or let go of climate and make it something about water, right? And that, the inner side of that is how do I let go of my plan, my script, my story, my word, even my ego, which wants me to do things in the context of uh, climate change, right? And the last and final fragment, uh, somewhat uh, between these two dimensions, the first of which is all encompassing, it's about me and my life. The second is slightly more on community. The third is an organizational story. Right? The Initiative for Climate Action, which is the nonprofit that I started uh, along with friends in uh, 2020, is interested in transformative system change. And uh, we are headquartered in Bangalore and we really work on every element of the climate story, food, energy, water systems, forests, biodiversity, so on and so forth. And we uh, discover that uh, uh, there's a huge demand uh, for organizations uh, that are doing systemic work in the climate space in India. Right? Not only is there a huge demand, there's a huge influx of money into 
the climate space, right? Uh, money that is coming from the government of India, but money that's also coming from foreign philanthropic uh, 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 initiatives. And very quickly in our first year, uh, we, we built up a community of 60 members and we had a whole bunch of interesting projects to get started on, right? But what I discovered was that all of our 60 members, and I am very much uh, included in that list, are in some sense grievously wounded by the rhythm of capitalism and the trauma of modernity. So much as we have all this opportunity, you have a bunch of people who in some sense are still reeling from what competitiveness, from what linear time, from what continuous growth have done to them. This fear of missing out, this fear of being more than uh, you are, right? And so though it was uh, quite uh, uh, perplexing initially, we slowly realized that we can't really be doing effective climate work when all of us in some sense are uh, desperately in need of healing, right? So the pivot in the organizational work, rather from delivering programs and uh, uh, completing projects became to how do we create a prefigurative space, a space of personal and political healing uh, that allows for you to find community, right? And, and our premise is that once we do that, uh, the work, the contracts, the projects, the opportunities will follow, right? And this, of course, is not an easy position to take it. In some sense, requires you to talk in a slightly kooky way uh, with, with folks who just want you to take their money and give them uh, project uh, uh, deliverables uh, in that sense. So I'm going to stop with those three fragments. I'm also out of my time, and I'm going to invite you uh, to join me in this activity. It's an activity that is borderline meditational, or it could be fully meditational for you. Uh, the intention in creating it is to allow for you and to allow for us uh, to find something within our own story uh, where this inner outer binary was either uh, uh, transcended or it became very visible, or in some sense, you discovered parts of you that uh, 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 vibrated uh, 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 in resistance or vibrated with excitement at the uh, space of this uh, boundary or border, right? So um, uh, are, are friends ready to give this a, a try? Okay, cool. So uh, once again, I'll invite you to sit comfortably in your seat. You could lie down if you wish switch off your video if you're more comfortable with that, and just take a moment to reconnect with the ground beneath your feet. If your feet are touching the earth or touching the floor, the seat that's holding you up. As you breathe in, really register where the air is touching your body. Can you feel it in your nostrils, your throat? Do you feel your lungs expand? Let go of the air, acknowledging its fluidity. I invite you to take a moment to tell yourself and to tell the world that you're going to go on a journey into your own life, looking for a moment in the past where some element of your inner transformation, either the transformation you were undergoing, the transformation you were desiring, the transformation that you felt was vital to you, connected with the work that you were doing externally. This could be work in the climate space, it could be work in the education space, it doesn't matter, right? Where where really you felt this inner, outer binary or border became very present, very alive for you. Try and identify that moment 
if you have several coming up, try and pick one which feels particularly relevant to you at this moment. It feels alive to you. Try and visualize what was going on in your life at that moment. Try and sense what was the outer and what was the inner in that moment. Where was the boundary? Was it a value of yours that was not sitting with the value of the work you were involved with? Was it a learning? Was it a desire? Just breathe in deep and really locate yourself in that moment. And if you can, I invite you to try and invoke your memory, your body memory, memory of your mind, even the memory of the world to surface any resistance that occurred at that moment. A resistance to this blurring of boundaries, this intrusion of one boundary or one world into the other. Where did you feel that resistance? How did it feel? How did you react to that resistance? You just take your time to sense that. And I'd like to move us to the end of this activity by inviting you staying in that memory, staying in that very early stage appreciation of how you reacted to the inner and outer to think about, to identify, to name, to visualize what you would have done differently if in that position today. Is there something that would have changed in what you said, what you did, how you reacted? what you let go of. And I just invite you to think about that, stay with that. If you can give it a word or a shape, please do so. And slowly, Let's agree to return back to our session at the conference. With a deep breath, you could open your eyes if they were closed and be fully present here. Right, if you have uh, a word or a shape, I invite you to write that down or draw that on a diary. If you wish, you could put it in the chat box as well. Uh, but try and give that a material uh, manifestation and uh, you could return to that as you think about this uh, at a more leisurely time for yourself. So that's it from me. I hope uh, you enjoyed uh, the activity and, and some of the comments uh, stirred things for you. Uh, I see some words coming through. Uh, thank you, there's a, a liberation there. It's a lovely word. Thanks for sharing and uh, I think uh, we are close to the end of our allocated one hour, but we had a desire to really have a little bit of an open space uh, at the end of our comments together. So maybe we can proceed uh, into that. And uh, uh, Lakshmi, would you like to maybe uh, react or respond to something or would you like to take us into a, a round of quick uh, comments? Thanks, Abhay. That was... Uh, yeah, that was lovely. Thank you for the presentation. And also, uh, thank you for bringing in uh, rootedness and ancestors into, into the space. 
appreciate that. Uh, Dan, quickly, um, do you have a session coming up soon? What is our... Yeah, I was just sending Abhe a message and I was in the process of sending you a message. You're welcome to flow over five to 15 minutes. I think the next folks that will be coming in this Zoom room will be coming, uh, yeah, about 20 minutes from now. So right. yeah, feel Thank free you. to flow a little bit over if you feel called to do so. Thanks. Yeah, so every if we are a small group here, so we would really love to hear from you. Um, if you'd like to share, whether it's about your own journey, uh, what you're grappling with with your inner and outer, um, or just uh, comments or feedback, anything is welcome. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Lakshmi. Thanks, Abhay. So your stories were uh, very relatable and at the same time very inspiring. I have one question from Abhay. Abhay, um, you said, uh, let's go off this climate script, our ego, my own story, my own uh, script. And even then work with that community. Can you share some example that it really worked out? Thank you, uh, Kanwal. Yeah, I, I think the um, example that really comes to mind uh, would be in the context of uh, 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 waste work uh, in, in the city of Bangalore, right? Uh, it is uh, uh, so central uh, to, to thinking about uh, 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 climate change, right? Just once you get into uh, materiality and cultures of consumption, cultures of growth, also, I mean, if you want to talk about carbon, of course, uh, uh, the carbon involved with the production processes uh, itself uh, uh, make uh, waste and, and uh, processes of circularity and uh, uh, communities uh, who are performing the service of, of really uh, recovering, recycling, uh, so central to, to talking about climate, right? But uh, in, in the context of, uh, my and admittedly limited work on this in, in Bangalore, uh, climate itself is not a very accessible uh, vocabulary uh, uh, for waste workers. Uh, they're called poor karmikars uh, uh, in Bangalore, right? And uh, in that context, really welcoming uh, uh, the conversation around, uh, around materials, around livelihood, around uh, even uh, uh, cultures of use and throw, as opposed to cultures of repair and recover, uh, has been very valuable for us. And, and uh, uh, at least in one city across the world, Accra, uh, uh, in, in Ghana, but also I hope in Bangalore soon, uh, I would really uh, uh, like for these conversations to feature as uh, mainstream and significant conversations in, in what it means for the city, uh, to transition to a regenerative future. So that's where we've had, uh, I wouldn't say success, but our own openness to taking the stories as they came to us uh, has uh, been a good decision because it really allowed us to, to see how uh, central this was to thinking about uh, climate and uh, uh, fair transition in the context of a uh, city in India. Thank, thanks, Abhi. Uh, thanks, thanks for sharing that. In fact, uh, in Bangalore, I'm also in touch with Has Harisadullah Masur, who, who are actively doing that work. Uh, so I, I wanted to hear something apart from a waste, uh, waste worker context. Uh, <laughs> sorry to say, I really appreciate you shared it. Uh, so this is something I... Um, Maybe it is coming out of my ego again, <laughs> that I knew it. Uh, wanted to hear something, for example, if it is a vendor, let's say those vendors, uh, street vendors, or somebody uh, who is in the administration, even in the uh, BBMP, uh, Bangalore administration, how you make that connect with them so that it's not the climate story, but still it is a connect with them. 
Thank you. Yeah, I, I think uh, it will be good uh, to actually have this conversation uh, uh, more directly. Uh, immediately, uh, I think uh, uh, my, my own uh, anecdotes are, are uh, beginning to appear, but I, I don't have a direct story to give you on, on connecting with the Bangalore administration yet. So, so it would be good if we could actually exchange uh, details. It looks like you have some uh, interest in the city as well. And uh, this is a conversation that I would really uh, like to get into with no constraint on on the tank to it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, I, I just sent you a LinkedIn request. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. So I would, uh, I would park my next question uh, for others to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Would you like to share anything? I'm happy to share a bit. Um, yeah, I joined today, Lakshmi, because I I um, joined a session a couple of days ago when you were, where you were a panelist, and then I looked up what you were doing, and I was quite inspired by it. Um, and yeah, so I wanted to come today and and listen in more detail to what your well, what everyone here is working on. But for me, I've um, been trained as a science academic um, for many years working in academia and um, over time grew very disenchanted um, with the process and the system and um, and so I also started a nonprofit um, about nine years ago um, and we've been designing courses for um, environmental leadership but the but there's quite a lot of a broad scope to what we can do with our courses. But I'm also at a point now where I feel that working in this nonprofit, well, okay, let me start by saying that I think for me, the biggest journey has been from coming from that very, seeing the world um, through a very scientific lens to moving much more into a spiritual place. Um, so that's changed the lens through which I see the world deeply. Um, and now what I feel is that the, a lot of the trauma that we're inflicting on the planet is because we're disconnected from ourselves. Um, and so I feel very inspired to do a lot more work with like deep work with people. So deep ecology courses um, and other modalities of just really trying to connect with people and get people to connect to nature and to connect to themselves and to other people um, in meaningful spaces, but in the nonprofit that I'm running, I'm still finding a lot of frustration around this being in this system of trying to find funding and um, remain viable. And um, yeah, and so I think where I'm at now is in a space where I want to go independent um, to have that freedom to really share what I want to share with the world. In a, in a less constrained space where you have to meet donor requirements or I, we also work very closely with a, I'm in South Africa and we work with the National Parks um, Authority here because we, ha we have a facility that we run in one of the parks. And so I'm very constrained by what they want us to do. Um, and it's all, and that's, that space feels very mainstream and I feel very inspired to move out of that mainstream space and into something a lot more creative and, and deeply connecting. And so I think to do that, the realization that I've just had recently is that I'm gonna have to, I think, go independent so that I can create this. But yeah, so I'm just, I'm so inspired by this whole conference um, and, and the things that people are achieving and doing. And yeah, I'm sort of looking for how, within myself for how I want to make an impact and what I really wanna step into doing now. Yeah. Thank you, Karen, uh, and thanks for coming back for the second session. I hope you got a little bit more this time. They are so short, you know, it's uh, really, yeah. I'm, and I'm happy to connect. Um, I'll, I will write my email and we can connect. I mean, I, yeah. um, I really hear you um, with what you're going through. I mean, that is the struggle, right, with uh, in doing anything alternate in this world right now. Um, I'm, yeah, um, 
I'm, in India right now, in fact, the government is stopping any sort of funding, in, international funding coming in for environmental, um, uh, anything that's a bit different, you know? So there's a lot of uh, money coming in for technocratic solutions and renewable energy and all of that. Uh, and any yeah, subnational climate change sort of strategy uh, work. Um, but I find it really difficult to, um, and and also with fundamentalist the right wing government as well, you know, how uh, how you get under um, how you get spotted, uh, and then you put people that you work with you know, at risk as well. Um, and so even getting funding from um, uh, international funders can be difficult, depending on what kind of work you're doing. Um, and having said that, um, totally understand about donor. Uh, expectations and limitations that come from that and I myself found myself feeling that if I had a hybrid way where I can still because it, where I've also been through that route where you need the uh, money from the courses to keep going you know and then that's a huge it, you burn out very quickly um, from that as well because you never know uh, how many people are going to come you know it's always a struggle so how do you kind of support yourself because I think people who are doing this work need to be supported and to have a comfortable life um, because we are already you know we're choosing um, our life choices are difficult in this world already yeah and on top of that, if we don't have the monetary support, if we get sick or just having that additional worry about things can be also very difficult. So um, it's a question that is very alive for me. How do you find a way that the work is um, supported, that uh, you don't have to go from one voice to um, uh, but at the same time, have the freedom to experiment and to be innovative and to do the work that needs to emerge. Uh, so I don't have answers to that, but I really am with you in this. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Okay, uh, Dan, are we close to how we're going? Yeah. Um, seven more minutes if you want to continue, if not, any time is Okay, open. so uh, one more person if you would like to share. If nobody's sharing, can I ask? <laughs> um, Anna, were you going to say something? I saw you move towards the screen. Was that... <laughs> Uh, and, well, uh, I just thought that she was going to share, so that's why. Um, and if we still have time, I think you can have one more question. Yeah, is that okay? Well, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I just resonated really much with that question because I'm in, like, I'm on a track where I, I also realized that I have to go all the way for uh, this more independent uh, way where I investigate and be really good at teaching these in and outer aspects of sustainability to young people. But I'm 24 and I have never uh, went to an education, higher education, because I've had so um, big longing for learning and being and experiencing. But I'm right now in a place where I'm like, okay, I have to decide if I need some kind of higher education or should I just go with this? I can feel it's good, but don't, I don't have any papers. And then I'm like, don't have, um, it's just a uncertainty. And therefore it's really nice to hear from you guys that have done more um, professional and educational things. And also to, to hear that um, it's still a struggle and, and maybe it doesn't, uh, there's not a result after going to different universities or different jobs, but it's, it's a new thing and we all have to figure that out and we can support our, each other, even if we are yeah, all ages. <laughs> um, and I feel like also trust a lot that the world will also help us maybe to find a way 
uh, because everything is changing, right? Uh, and maybe also the rules of <laughs> how to, to feel safe also with like money and home and everything. So I don't know if I have a question, but it's just the sharing and the resonance of, of that worry, but also uh, I really want to trust in it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, that's a very beautiful place to leave with trust. I think, Kanwal, you had a quick question and then we, let's see if it's a quick answer. Thanks, Lakshmi. Uh, Lakshmi, you talked about burnout. Uh, I think you use this word quite frequently. And in fact, I relate to it. And every one and a half years to two years, I was going through a burnout. <laughs> and, but last two years, uh, I, uh, so my last burnout was in 2019, December. That time decided no more burnouts. <laughs> so, uh, so no more burnouts. I've been taking care of myself a lot, but at the same time, my pace has slowed down. Uh, you use the word anger. That anger uh, subsided. With that anger, even the energy has subsided. So I'm not putting that kind of a um, efforts into this uh, again. There is at the back of the mind, there can be another work, burnout and the offering. So it's it's something uh, mutually exclusive also. Uh, I found that uh, uh, if we do that self-care, then energy also is getting down. Do you have any, <laughs> any suggestions for this? Uh Abhay, okay, you can jump in, but I can uh, quickly say my comments to that is that I think we all need to slow down. Um, and so that's okay. That's totally okay. But you did touch upon something I think is very important, which is that anger gives energy. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's not a bad emotion per se. Um, anger comes when a boundary is breached and the, the energy comes for the action that needs to be taken. Um, and so it is an emotion that is very valuable for us. It's just that in our twisted world, uh, anger becomes aggression very quickly. Uh, and um, therein lies a, uh, a problem. And so, um, so uh, for me, the, my relationship with anger is not that I don't welcome it, I do. Um, but I give it space and a container so that the energy that comes with it helps me to act in this world. This is a whole new topic, but I would just leave it there because I think someone's coming in now, so.